Welcome back, class. We have two more sections to do, one on economics and one on eugenics, and we will be concluded. I'm confident that this section and the next section will not be quite as long as the previous two. I would like to say, though, that I don't believe I was really prattling all that much in the last two sections, that everything I said did have a very good point to be made. Uh, so while they were longer, I believe that it was necessary to deliver uh, that long of a lecture uh, than what I typically would like to do. But nevertheless, let us move on to our section on economics. Now, by this point, I don't know if you would have uh, been, follow, been able to follow all of this as, um, as well as I hope. Like I said before, and again, just to reiterate, I'm kind of pulling from different lectures here to do this unit. This unit was pretty unique. I've looked at other classes or other people who've taught this class before, and they didn't do a section specifically about these, these sort of social Darwinistic racial sciences. They just kind of put them in little by little incrementally uh, in the first and second uh, units about imperialism and about industrialism. But I think it's important enough to warrant its own week. As you can see, it is uh, very influential the way people, particularly the European world, begins to look at the world as part of this large hierarchy, this pyramid, if you will, where they are on top and these others are on the bottom. And spoiler alert, this is very important coming next week because as they branch out, looking outward toward the world, they will integrate these other, quote, lesser peoples into their own empires. And a lot of these ideas are going to be put to the test and put into practice. So that's why it is important to bring this all up. So how does economics fit in? Where does economics fit in? Economics has nothing to do with race. Economics has very little to do with uh, anything other than making money. And if you recall from last week, we talked about industrialism. So how the heck does all of this fit together? Well, remember in our last week, we talked about the factory system and how you had these factory uh, owners and factory operators, these captains of industry, if you will, they command much in the way of power and prestige, and they use these machines to, to make products. <clears throat> to make products, but the machines do not run entirely on their own. They need factory labor. And so factory labor is brought in and factory labor is made up of the poorer classes, uh, the working class. And they are, I believe one person pointed out very well in their discussion, they are like factory machines themselves. If one person gets injured, loses a hand, a finger, an eye, they are summarily released and somebody else is very quickly hired to replace them. So the people are machines as well as the actual machines. So in that sense, you're looking at class. You're looking at a group of people on top that maybe the Petite, what Marx would call the petite bourgeoisie underneath, that would be like the factory managers, uh, professional classes like accountants, marketers, uh, store owners, people like that, and then people below them, the middle class, and then eventually the working class and the poor. But you can integrate race and ethnicity in this also because race and ethnicity uh, is a function of class and is a result of class. So we are now integrating class and race together. And so therefore economics is going to be very, very important in this conversation. And one very specific economic theory will be the most important of them all. And that will be, whoop, forgot about this little slide. That will be laissez-faire economics. Now, what is laissez-faire economics? Did I make the slide? Ah, here we go. Laissez-faire, I'll get to that slide in a second. Laissez-faire economics is a very, what we might call today, right-leaning or libertarian view, although there is a, a left version I'll get to in a minute, uh, view of economics in which there is very little, if any, government regulation or oversight and instead, what you have is a total market system. That's what laissez-faire means. It's a free market. Uh, this is a little bit different than free enterprise. We do have free enterprise here in the United States, and we've always had free enterprise. 
But free enterprise can also mean a mixed economy, which is what we have. Laissez-faireism would be a very, very, very pure uh, economic system. Absolutely no government regulation, as little as possible. And everything in theory is market driven. So in theory, again, as a consumer, all of us would be consumers. We vote with our dollars, to use the phrase. Uh, if I was uh, competing for your class attendance between several other uh, professors teaching this exact same class, the winner would be chosen based on who you sign up for, not uh, anything other, uh, any, not, but not by anything else. So the fact that you, all of you would have chosen me over somebody else means that I am the winner based on the virtue that I was able to win your investment, win your money, win your dollars, uh, so to speak. So everything is purely market driven. The market is unfettered, it's private, and it solves all the problems. You also have, as you can see at the bottom of this list, a system that is purely individual. Now, there are lots of people involved, but by individual, I mean employee and employer, consumer and a distributor, workers and buyers. Uh, we don't look, uh, we, in theory, we don't look at the system in terms of corporations and unions and things like that. Even though unions exist and corporations exist, a corporation, as the name suggests, is a, a company that's made up of investors and stockholders. But instead, a laissez-faire economist uh, would look at this as a as a uh, world of a single employer, namely something like Henry Ford or uh, that factory that we read the, uh, about the rules for. That would be considered a single employer because there would be a guy that's kind of in charge of all that. He would be your employer, and all the workers would be their employees, and all the workers uh, are supposed to, again, in theory. Uh, um, negotiate for their wages and negotiate for their benefits and negotiate for anything with their jobs between worker, individual worker and individual employer. Of course, any of us who've ever worked for a large company before knows that that's not always the case. If I worked for Microsoft, I can't, I can't call up the top. And if I worked for Microsoft and I was a, a guy who sold software, I can't necessarily pick up the phone and call the top CEO and tell him I want to renegotiate my contract. I would have to go to somebody in HR who puts me in charge, puts me in touch with somebody else who might put me in touch with somebody else. Uh, so the bigger the company and the more workers, the harder this gets to actually do. But in theory, this is still considered to be the best form of economics for a lot of people at this time. And mainly the people who are going to be pushing laissez-faire economics will be the massively wealthy to begin with because they are the captains of industry. The gentleman pictured here is Andrew Carnegie, and we read a excerpt from his uh, work last week, The Gospel of Wealth. He was a Pittsburgh steel tycoon, Scottish born, but he became an American and the founder of the Carnegie Foundation and the Carnegie Library System. Uh, but he was one of the wealthiest men in the world at his time and is still considered one of the wealthiest men to have ever lived. He would have been a proponent of laissez-faire economics, at least to a certain degree. There is a form of left-leaning laissez-faireism, and that would be very similar to what Henry George in Progress of Poverty would have uh, uh, advocated for, although we didn't get a big taste of that because I only gave you an excerpt of him describing the problems. Henry George would have believed in minimal taxes, but taxes that were assessed in appropriate ways to redistribute the wealth, but not communism and not collectivism in that sense. Here on this economic spectrum, laissez-faireism falls in here on the extreme right, whereas communism falls on the extreme left. And here in between, you have what most countries have in Western Europe and in the United States. You have mixed economies. But in, again, laissez-faireism in theory is very popular on this side. And you can see here uh, that you're going to have productivity 
uh, you're going to have um, lots of wealth being created, but there's definitely a wealth gap that's going to come out of this, and there is going to be minimal safety nets in in uh, in play. Uh, you can also see where we're going with this discussion of economics, because on this list we have self reliance, uh, and that's going to be a big issue. Because what is self reliance? Self reliance is is a um, an expression of one's own creativity and one's own ability for success. And so in a sense, self-reliance and the ability to succeed in this world is an example of survival of the fittest. And so as we move forward, we're going to see how laissez-faireism will become an exp will 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 um, become an example of social Darwinism because of its emphasis on survival of the fittest, its emphasis on hierarchy, its emphasis on integrating structures between those who have it on top and those who don't on the bottom, and the need for an elite uh, few to govern those who are not nearly as elite as they are. And that's what we're going to go with here. So let's explore this further. So how do social Darwinism and economics go together? Pretty much already answered that. You have this kind of world in which you have an elite few on top uh, in the United States, in Great Britain. This is going to be, and I've beaten this word, uh, beaten this phrase with a dead horse, but white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the elite of the elite, the captains of industry, who see the workers below them as being uh, lesser than them in some way, maybe because of their race, maybe because of their ethnicity, maybe because of their immigration status, uh, or maybe just because they're rich and they're poor. Everybody is different. But you have this system in which the wealthiest on top uh, receive more money at the expense of the workers below, as you can see by this political cartoon, which is definitely um, sympathetic to the workers over these captains of industry, or some might, like Mark Twain, refer to them as robber barons. But you see the hierarchical system here beginning with those very elite on top overseeing everything else below. In this case, though, it's being applied to uh, the manufacturing of goods and the acclimation of wealth. Oh, let's let's back up for a second. So we um, we read a little bit about this uh, in the Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie, but you may not have picked up on it because you haven't had this lecture yet. So I want to read two excerpts for you from the Gospel of Wealth to really kind of emphasize how uh, social Darwinism fits into social Darwinism concepts of racial hierarchy uh, and, and superior hierarchy and civilization all fit together with this long lecture uh, that we've been talking about with social Darwinism. So let me go over here and just read this. And one piece is certainly longer than the other, and I do apologize for that. But here we are. This is the Gospel of Wealth. I have here in the first paragraph, the first excerpt I'm going to read, and down here near the end, the next excerpt I'm going to read. And I have these bolded, so feel free to go read them for yourselves as well. But let me take a moment and read them for you right here. <clears throat> So this is the first, in the first paragraph of the Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie. So, <clears throat> the Indians are today, I think that's supposed to be were, the Indians are today were civilized uh, man than was. Ugh, I don't like the way he put that. When visiting the Sioux, I was led to the wigwam of the chief. It was just like the others in external appearance. And even within, the difference was trifling between it and those of the poorest of his, of his braves. The contrast between the palace of the millionaire and the cottage of the laborer with us today measures the change which has come, up, come with civilization. This change, however, is not to be deplored, but welcomed as highly beneficial. It is well, nay, essential for the progress of the race that the houses of some should be homes for all that is highest and best in literature and arts and for all the refinements of civilization rather than that none should be so. So what we have here is this kind of comparison between Native Americans that you do have a class of elites uh, in Native American society such as the Sioux, but that the differences between them are particularly small. Remember, Henry George talked about this too, that before industrialism, the gap between 
most people in the United States was not particularly large. But then as industrialism comes about, it gets wider and wider and wider. And you have wealthier, 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 and you have poorer, poorer, and poorer. Poverty comes where progress comes. Here, Andrew Carnegie is responding to that, and he's disagreeing. Uh, he says, yes, that, that we do have these palaces for millionaires like himself, and we have these small, humble cottages for laborers. But the benefits that have come with this, quote, civilization, civilization has come because of industrialism, uh, far outweighs anything that has uh, existed before. It is highly beneficial. This is progress for the race. Now, race in the sense to his credit is actually referring to the human race, but you can definitely see how he's integrating industrialism and civilization here and how there is a world of haves and have nots. Uh, and he's also highlighting these industrial societies as societies that have provided the highest and best in literature, the arts and other refinements of civilization. So you can read you can read into that that other societies that are not nearly as well off that have not progressed as much do not have these higher attributes of literature and the arts and these other refinements especially the refinement itself of civilization now going further down near the end he is much more uh, uh, direct the man of wealth thus becoming the is thus becoming he's referring to the th this third phase of giving one's wealth away in the form of philanthropy and by doing that the man of wealth thus becoming the mere agent and trustee of his poorer brethren bringing to their service his superior wisdom experience and ability to administer doing for them better than they would or could do for themselves now some of you might be thinking that well yes a much more successful and educated individual is probably better at managing money, and that's possibly true. But remember that one of the suggestions he had was giving some of this money away in equitable distribution. But he shoots that down as being too inefficient and saying that the poor really wouldn't know what to do with that money. They wouldn't know how to use it properly. Instead, because of charity and philanthropy in the creation of these symphonies and libraries and stuff like that, educational grants, the wealthy individual is, the, is now the representative of the poor, the agent of the poor, the defender of the poor, the trustee of the poor. Uh, and he is bringing this kind of experience and this, as he says, superior wisdom and this ability to administer money for their benefit. It, essentially, he looks at the poor as being almost childlike to himself, uh, the way your parents might administer your money. Uh, let's say you make a little money and your, your, your dad or your mom might be like, well, I'm going to keep that money for you because you're just going to spend it on stupid things. That's kind of what he's saying here. It's very what we would call paternalistic. Now, again, I want to defend Andrew Carnegie because he did a lot of excellent things. Uh, and I'm not saying that Andrew Carnegie was necessarily racist or anything. I'm trying to be very careful here. But I do want to point out that this sort of laissez-faire view of the world, this kind of view of minimal government intervention, uh, anti-union position, uh, hyper-individualism between employer and employee, rich and poor, the structures of class in this society uh, being very hierarchical, there is this paternalistic aspect here. He sits at the top, everybody sits below. They all benefit from the money he makes by his generosity and his wisdom and his uh, civility. He is going. He himself is going to bring civilization to the world. And civilization, of course, comes as a benefit of industrialism, which we talked about last week. So you can see how this is all starting to work together. All we need to do now is integrate more directly class and ethnicity into this system, which we will and we'll talk about in, our, in the rest of the section and the last section. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's talk one, uh, mom uh, one moment more about another economic aspect that is very important. That is the uh, freedom of contract. Freedom of contract sounds very good. <coughs> it sounds very American, very British. It's something I alluded to before. 
if you are working or if you want a job at a factory, you go to the owner of the factory and you ask him for a job. He gives you a job and you to draw up a contract of benefits and wages and duties and things between you. And when you want to renegotiate that contract, you do it with the employee employer, I'm sorry, directly. Doing this emphasizes social Darwin, or, I'm sorry, laissez-faire aspects because it is taking out the idea that there would be some sort of collective bargaining agreement between, say, a union and its employees. And it also ignores the aspect that there are corporate individuals as well. It, it emphasizes, again, that hyper-individualism that despite the fact that these are gigantic factories with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, sometimes even thousands, thousands of people that you would still have this kind of personalized and individual relationship between employee and employer. And what this really does is it satisfies the idea that the employer, uh, somebody like an Andrew Carnegie, sits at the very top of this pyramid with all of his workers below, but also it provides strength to their position because an employee who doesn't have to uh, negotiate with a collective bargaining unit like a union doesn't have to necessarily deal with uh, um, his employees at the same degree of respect. Uh, he can hire and fire at will, and he can pay whatever he deems correct, whatever he, whatever quote, the market quote, deems correct, whatever that might be. So this hyper-individualism is all part of laissez-faireism, and I kind of put this here. Men of property, people like Andrew Carnegie, people like white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, elites, uh, viewed contract as the foundation of civilization. So industrialism breeds, helps to breed and, and codify civilization. A contract is an expression of that industrial civilization. Agreements between employees and employers made between individuals, individuals that operate within this laissez-faire capitalist system. Uh, the elites are in this high position to promote their own interests. And they there's this belief that people succeed and fail on their own talents. And that's completely respectable. But remember, we're talking about people who already are in positions of power using their money and their wealth and their uh, influence on government to promote these pos these positions uh, in order to stay in power as well. They have they are the master they are their masters of their domain. They are the captains of industry. They are uh, at the top of their race and the top of their class. Uh, so all of this reflects laissez-faireism, and laissez-faireism is integrated into social Darwinism because it has that eye towards a superior pyramid system between the haves and the have-nots. And again, have-nots or the working class might also be people of the lesser races and lesser ethnicities. The people at the top will always be the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And as we heard, or as I read from the Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie, it is those white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who, in their wisdom and leadership, their natural bred leadership, will be benevolent and give the money that they've earned to others for uh, to hopefully better themselves as much as they could possibly better themselves. It's hard to better oneself at a library when you work 16 hours a day, 364 days a year. But nevertheless, it is an idea that these leaders among men will shower the lesser people around them with gifts, whether it's a library or in the case of other people, uh, many elites, uh, including some African-American elites, with the creation of, say, institutes to teach black people how to um, be tailors and uh, how to start their own businesses like the Tuskegee uh, Institutes and the Hamptons Institutes. These would be all aspects that are benevolent, uh, the rich endowed their lessers with the ability to better themselves, at least as much as those people can possibly better themselves. And you can see here at the end, uh, it apart from whatever government in, uh, influence th that they can get for themselves, any other government influence in the form of a regulation or in recognizing a labor union or creating labor law would be considered antithetical to this idea that uh, the great captains of industry and the elite of a certain society uh, has between employee and employer. Uh, those types of things, those types of regulations upset this natural uh, order that we see here. 
So social Darwinism and liberty of contract shifted the traditional interpretation of freedom from small, independent producers like a farmer or a, a, an employee who works in a cottage, what's called a cottage industry. Think of like a small gunsmith or think of a cobbler who makes shoes or a blacksmith who makes things out of metal. Uh, it takes these small, independent producers and turns it into a system of hyper pure individualism uh, in, an, in, a, in an economic system of purely unrestrained capitalism with the wealthiest uh, industrial factory owners on top and everyone else on the bottom. That's what I'm really trying to impart to you here. And finally, we will move on to eugenics in the last video.